So I grew up here in Scarborough, in this suburb outside of uh, Toronto. This is the first school I ever went to. So the first day of school, I guess I was five, six years old, walking through the front doors for the first time. My sister and I were the only Jewish students in the school, maybe the only Jewish students that ever went to this school. On day one of school, we walked through these doors, and there was a swastika carved right here in the front door. And it stayed there all year. It was carved deep in the wood. This, the school, I think they wanted to do something about it, but they just didn't know what to do. There was no mystery about who had done it. It was a kid who, who was, who, who, I mean, he made our lives hell all, all that year. But the school had no policy. There was no process. There was no procedure. There was no, there was no debate in society about anti-Semitism. Finally, my parents pulled us out of school. We learned at home for a few months. 1972. Fast forward almost 40 years, and you can find the fight against anti-Semitism here, at a gala dinner in Ottawa's Museum of Civilization. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been warned repeatedly, and we've been admonished to take action. I would suggest, if not us, who? If not now, when? Thank you. With a half a million dollars of help from the government of Canada, Politicians and experts from around the world have gathered for a conference of the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Anti-Semitism. The event features a Nobel Prize winner. Since 1945, I was not as afraid as I am now. Canadian cabinet ministers. We are reminded of the historic roots of this ancient and pernicious hatred. But the signs are all around us even Canada's Prime Minister. We must be relentless in exposing this new anti-Semitism for what it is. The conference is clearly designed to have maximum political impact here in Canada. But there's one fact that complicates the narrative being woven. Even those closest to the fight say that anti-Semitism is no mortal threat in Canada today. There is no wave of anti-Semitism in Canada. No, 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 absolutely not. No, it's funny. I've heard people who uh, have criticized us saying that we think this, but no, there, there is absolutely no spike in the kinds of uh, anti-Semitic incidents that uh, I think appall us. No, I, I don't think anti-Semitism is a huge problem in Canada. In fact, as I've written, I think Canada is probably the least anti-Semitic country in the entire world, including Israel. And I thought that this might appear as a kind of psychological disconnect because what we would be discussing would be global anti-Semitism, but it would be taking place in the Canadian arena, and people would look at it through the Canadian prism and say, you know, why are we doing this? Critics of the conference and the coalition hosting it think they have the answer to that question. It can only be seen as some political charade to, to counter what clearly is a growing sense that Israel needs to, uh, needs to be criticized, deserves to be criticized. If you say criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, then you can argue that there's a problem because Israel does have a public relations problem in Canada on their hands. When 1.5 million people are stuck in an open air prison. It's true that the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel is gaining support in Canada. In the past five years, each Israeli military action has been met with bigger protests than the last. And Israel is watching it all closely. Here's how one senior Israeli diplomat views Canada. The most important arena in the world for this new campaign or other new battlefield that uh, on one hand have all those who wants to delegitimize Israel and on the others all those who wants to present it in its full colors. Jewish organizations embrace the idea that Canada is a key battleground in the fight over Israel's legitimacy. A country's prime minister is uniquely well placed to observe all of this. In this context, the Ottawa conference is another counterattack. And the BDS movement is clearly considered a high value target the poster child for the new anti-Semitism. Well, its substance is as crude as ever. Its method is now 
more sophisticated. It targets the Jewish people by targeting the Jewish homeland, Israel, as the source of injustice and conflict in the world and uses perversely the language of human rights to do so. In 2005, the first Israeli Apartheid Week was held at the University of Toronto. You have the uh, leading political figures in Israel accepting this uh, situation. Uh, Despite its characterization by critics as a hate fest, the majority of its events are lectures, often low-key, as academic as they are political. Five years after the call has been made, BDS has, has become a term that now has global residence. This annual campus event has now spread to more than 60 cities worldwide. And more than any other factor, it is the use of the word apartheid in relation to Israel that sparks passionate debate. You loosely throw the word apartheid around, and then you label every Jew that supports the state of Israel as a racist. It is essentially a bludgeon used to silence critics of Israeli atrocities and of Western support for them. That a Jewish state should not exist as a Jewish state, that today, for many Jews, is now the epitome of what is anti-Semitism. Israel does exist. If you look at any map, the Israel is on there. It's actually Palestine that isn't. If you also look at any map today, South Africa is on the map. It's the apartheid that was dismantled. But if you say that Israel, as an apartheid state, must be dismantled, then you're, you're getting to the point where you're denying its, its right to exist, and that part becomes anti-Jewish. Do you want Israel to disappear? I think Israel can continue to exist and not implement apartheid policies against the Palestinian people. It's apartheid that we're against. The fact uh, that that verbiage is being used on campus is intimidating and causes an atmosphere of fear on campus. And it is on campus where the most intense debates are taking place. Some Jewish students say they feel threatened. Meanwhile, some pro-Palestine students say they're facing intimidation from a controversial group that has re-emerged in Canada. In the one hand, a Torah. In the other hand, strength. They're quite aggressive. They scream unbelievably racist comments. They have physically attacked uh, our organizers. Their level of violence is escalating. The JDL was founded by Rabbi Meir Kahana in the 1970s. The political party that bears his name was banned in Israel after one of his followers murdered 29 Palestinians at prayer in Hebron. In the United States, an FBI terrorism report called the JDL a violent extremist organization after its leaders were indicted in a plot to bomb a mosque and assassinate a congressman. In Canada, the group operates openly from this rundown building in North Toronto. Its leader claims Kahana as his mentor. It's our land, and the only time there's going to be peace in Israel is when the Islamic world will come to terms with that reality and apologize to the Jewish people for the desecrations that they've committed over the centuries and the nerve to erect a mosque on the Temple Mount. The fact that the JDL exists in Canada isn't what's remarkable. What's remarkable is the way in which mainstream Jewish organizations have refused to seriously address their presence. Um, I'm not aware of the JDL undertaking any activities that uh, would give rise to suggestions that they were engaged in uh, things that uh, contravene Canadian law. You have been dis described as a violent group. Well, I don't know what we have done that says we're a violent group. JDL upholds the principle of Barzell Iron. Yeah, third. The need to both move to help Jews everywhere and to change the Jewish image through sacrifice and all necessary means, strength, force, and even violence. Yeah, but you got to understand what uh, violence is in the proper context, uh, the proper context. I mean, then you might as well close down every single martial arts club because they're violent. So you're just equating yourself to a martial arts club? I'm saying, well, the concept of self-defense is uh, understood and respected. In the Canada where I grew up, the country's relationship with Israel rarely surfaced in the national conversation. Today, the volume has been turned way up. 
leading politicians seem sometimes to be competing to offer the strongest support to one side in the Middle East's defining conflict. And with accusations of anti-Semitism flying, politicians who are critical keep their heads down, watching from the safety of their perch on Parliament Hill, while it's people in the streets who are the ones expressing opposition to Israel's policies. And Canada's Prime Minister? He's pressing the case even further, casting support for Israel in terms reminiscent of the Bush era, an epic struggle of good versus evil. But we do know that there are those today who would choose to do evil if so permitted. Thus, we must use our freedom to confront them and their anti-Semitism at every turn. The Canadian government has what I call an ignorance-based foreign policy. This is the paradox of freedom. That awesome power, that grave responsibility to choose between good and evil. They're not interested in knowing complexities. I'm not saying they should all take my position, but they should understand the world is a complex place and they don't see it that way. You have to really start from scratch. You're starting at A, Palestinians are human, B, they're not all terrorists, and then the conversation has to begin. But when Israel, the only country in the world whose very existence is under attack, is consistently and conspicuously singled out for condemnation, I believe we are morally obligated to take a stand. You know, we're human beings, and sometimes we're going to engage in these battles, and, uh, you know, the rest of the world will, will decide who the winner is somewhere down the line. For them, the world is a simple place, and the simplicities are all the wrong ones. It's very, very disappointing and very dangerous.